Hello everyone. Uh, today we are going to talk about data types and uh, data abstraction. Uh, remember that we have already talked about control abstraction uh, or functional abstraction, how functions hide their implementation. And part of what we are talking about today is uh, data abstraction. Now, some of the things that we talk about in this lecture is should be quite familiar to you uh, from uh, discussion in, in other uh, courses like uh, programming or, or data structures. So, uh, notice that uh, Every high-level programming language, high-level meaning languages like uh, C++ or Java or Python, uh, contain some constructs and mechanism for structuring data. Uh, remember that uh, uh, the underlying hardware machine manipulates data in the form of bit strings, but that form, of course, is not something that the programmer wants to manipulate. That would be very difficult. We need some uh, other constructs for structuring our data inside our programs. And uh, these constructs and, 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 and the mechanism used uh, uh, is called the type system. Or the, these constructs and the mechanisms are formed from what is called the type system of, of a language. And we will actually define um, a little bit later what we mean exactly by the type system. And notice that the types represent one of the important characteristics of a programming language. And uh, different programming languages have different type systems. And that's what makes really programming languages unique. So even though uh, programming languages may fall into the same high level category like object-oriented languages, you know, C++ and Java are object-oriented, they still have their own type system which uh, differ from each other. So the type system used in C++ is different from the type system used in Java, for example. Now, here's a definition of a, of a data type. So what is a data type? It's a homogeneous collection of values effectively presented, equipped with a set of operations which manipulate these values. So if we just take an example uh, of the data type integer, you notice that integer is usually a predefined data type in uh, all programming languages. So an integer is a homogeneous collection of values because integer stands for or represents uh, whole numbers. It doesn't represent a string or a boolean, it just represents whole numbers. It doesn't even represent uh, real values or double numbers. So it's homogeneous in, in that sense. It's effectively presented, meaning that, for example, on the hardware machine, the hardware machine has effective uh, uh, representation of, uh, uh, of integers. Now, that representation is, uh, is uh, uh, kind of hidden to us. We don't have to know exactly how it is represented, but we just assume that it's effectively, uh, effectively presented in the hardware machine. And finally, uh, the integer data type comes with a set of operations which, can, uh, which we can use to manipulate uh, uh, the values. What would, what would be example of operations for integers? Well, arithmetic operations like plus, like minus, like multiplication, like uh, division. So, according to this definition, integer is a true data type. Now, we could ask ourselves, why do we need data types in a program language? And the answer uh, can be at least threefold, and what is enumerated here is uh, that it uh, support, uh, supports us as programmers uh, at, the at design time, when we are designing our program. And we will go into each of these uh, 
fields, each of these items in a minute. The second item here is, at the program level, it is a support for correctness. And the reason here is that uh, is because of the type checker in the language. And the third part here is at the translation level, when the, when the uh, program is uh, compiled, this supports the implementation, the uh, what should happen at uh, runtime. How much memory should be allocated to, the, for example, the data type at, uh, at uh, compile time and, and then when the program runs as well. So if we start with this first point here uh, at the design level, uh, the presence of different types allows us as designers to use the type that is the most appropriate uh, to its concept. So for example, if we, we are writing a program that handles ho hotel reservations, we would like the, the it's very likely that the concepts that we are discussing are clients, are dates, prices, rooms, etc. So what we would like to do is to build types that correspond to these concepts. And not only when I say build types that correspond to these concepts, it also entails that we have a set of operations that we can apply to uh, values of these types. Remember how we defined a data type, a homogeneous collection of values equipped with a set of operations which manipulate these values. So that's important that we uh, at design time uh, design operations that can be applied to each of these concepts. Uh, and it's also important that we as designers can define new types and associate them with different concepts even if they are represented by the same values. So let's take an example with our hotel reservation. <clears throat> um, let's say that we um, can build a type called price and another one called rooms or room. Uh, and let's assume just that price are, are are whole numbers or integers. Rooms could be represented as integers as well, rooms being room numbers. But the, the operations that are applicable or allowed for price, the, the type price, are probably different from the operations that are allowed for um, rooms. You know, if you have rooms, we might have an operation to change a room or to reserve a room. If we have a price type, we might have an operation to give a disc discount on the price and so on. So the operations are different, even though the two types, price and room, are represented by the same values. So this is important for the designer as well, to define new types, even though they are represented by the underlying same values. Uh, and the last point here is that the use of distinct types can be seen both as, as a design issue, as we've been talking about, but also as a documentation tool. Meaning that if we can use types in a program and build new types, then the program is better documented. What do we really mean by this? Well, let's just take a example here. If we have a program and let's say we have a, 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 a type that we have defined and call it price, then I can declare a variable of that type. Let's say PR is my price variable. Then I have another type when I call it room and my R variable is of type room. Now, when a programmer uh, or a reader that uh, reads the program uh, looks at it, he or she immediately sees that PR is of type price and R is of type room. 
so in a way this looks it, it, it functions as a documentation like a like a comment this uh, the other way how would we do it if we didn't have the possibility of defining a new type we might do it this way since price is represented by an integer say i would declare a variable called price of type int and i would declare a variable of type with the name uh, room of type int. Uh, the name surely suggests how I'm going to use the variable. It's of course important to give uh, a meaningful name to variables, but this is not the same. It's not really the same uh, documentation as uh, as uh, defining a variable of a type price or a type room. An important other distinction here is that if I do the latter, then my program would be allowed to do the following. Does this make any sense? Well, the compiler wouldn't complain because all the three variables in this assignment statement are integers. But if I would do in using types, I would do something like, then the compiler would complain because I'm doing addition on two types and notice also that addition might not even be defined for an object of a variable of type price. I can control what operations are allowed if I'm able to define new types. In the latter example, I'm not able to control what operation is used. So, this was the first point about the, the, the reasons for the presence of data types. The second point here is at the program level as a support for correctness. Whoops. As a support for correctness. What do we mean? Well, every programming language has its own type checking rules. We know that. For example, uh, the, the type checker needs to check assignment statements like x is equal to an expression. What does it need to check? Well, it needs to check that the type of the expression on the right-hand side, the, the R value, uh, sorry, the type of the expression on the, on the right-hand side is equal or equivalent to the, uh, expression, to the type of the variable on the left-hand sides. And uh, that would be one one example of a, of a type checking. Uh, now, such type constraints are present in languages mainly to avoid logical uh, errors. For example, to if I try to sum the in, an integer and a string, it really doesn't make any sense. I mean, it doesn't make sense to do something like this. One plus John. So, the type, if I have a uh, uh, type checker in, a, in a, a statically typed language, and we would talk about static type checking later, then the type checker would uh, signal an error here. So the, the existence of types uh, helps in making the program more correct. So we mentioned the type checker. So its function is to determine the type constraints, uh, that, to determine that the type constraints are satisfied before the execution of a program, you know, or, or before we we uh, generate the code. And the type checker is really a component of the contextual syntactic checking phase of a compiler. Remember, we have already talked about the. Uh, the individual phases of a compiler. We did that in an earlier lecture. 
And one of the component was a syntax analyzer that um, checked if the sequence of tokens that were returned by the lexical analyzer constitute a valid sentence in the language. But there are some issues that cannot be uh, checked by the syntactic analyzer and uh, part of them are contextual in nature and uh, we had earlier uh, an assignment statement like x is equal to uh, 2 now if x is a string then this is a contextually invalid statement syntactically uh, it's valid, meaning that we have an assignment statement, we have a uh, variable on the left-hand side, we have the assignment token, and we have an expression on the right-hand side. It's fine syntactically, but it's a, it's a contextual syntactic constraint that says that the value of the right-hand side, the type of the value on the right-hand side, must equal the corresponds to the type on the left-hand side. So this is the function of the type checker. Now we mentioned earlier that in a way types function as um, a documentation tool. So we could say that types are a kind of comments, but they are in a way controlled comments because uh, uh, well we could say that the, the programmer communicates the legal ways with which the given object can be used by, by using the types, but unlike comments the compiler detects and signals every attempted incorrect use of these objects. Again, in our example here we, where we have types, PR variables of type price and R variables is of type room, the compiler can detect and signal an error here because uh, not only are we trying to add to different types, even the add operation might not be allowed for, say, the price object or the room object. So we have a comment about these different variables and of what types they are, but uh, unlike comments, comments cannot uh, f uh, function as a, like a compiler. The compiler will, will uh, use the types to help in deducing whether uh, a particular statement is, is uh, semantically correct or, or uh, fulfills the contextual constraint. Uh, now, in a way, we can say that types are uh, restrictive. What do we mean by that? Well, let's take an example. Um, let us assume that we have a sub-program that uh, is supposed to sort a vector. So in many languages, it's actually necessary to write one routine to sort an integer vector, another to sort vectors of characters, and still another for vectors of reals and so on. And notice that even though the, the, the algorithm is the same for all these cases, it's, it's only the type of the parameters uh, that is different. So the types here make the function kind of uh, restrictive. So what would be the, the way out here? Well, parameterized types, for example, like uh, templates in C++ is a solution. So in C++, uh, the programmer can, uh, can use uh, types as parameters to functions and at compile time then different variations of the functions are generated. One function that, that uh, expects uh, an integer vector, another that expects a vectors of characters, uh, the third for vectors of reals and, and so on. Now the last point here that we saw about uh, reasons for the presence of data types is for the uh, as a support for the implementation. So notice that 
the compiler can use types as an important source of information, like about the amount of memory to be allocated to various objects. So for example, that the compiler would allocate one word for an integer, one byte for a boolean, n words for a vector of integers, etc. So when we have types, uh, all of this information is available statically and does not change during execution. And this static allocation uh, that is used during compilation uh, helps us to optimize the operations that uh, are used. Uh, during uh, runtime. And we have actually one, mentioned one example earlier that uh, an access to an allocated variable in an activation record is performed using an offset from the pointer to an activation record and this offset depends on the size of the variable. If it's an integer then it, it might be a one word an offset. If it's uh, if it's uh, uh, a boolean, it might be one byte and so on. So the compiler assumes a particular size to from uh, it deduces the size from the type of the parameters and can use that to allocate uh, memory to the various objects. <laughs>